Praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone joining us, joining us on the Fountain of Israel Bible Studies program. I'm honored to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath day. We're going to jump right into our lesson, but before we do, please have your pen and paper with you as we journey through the scriptures. Now, today's lesson will be about the mark versus the seal. You know, a lot has been said about the mark of the beast and what it could be and what it is. And some people have thought that maybe it's uh, simply a barcode or a bar scan, you know, while others think it was this great big computer in um, overseas. And yet others think it's a type of credit card. And still others think that it could be a microchip inserted underneath the skin. Now, these things could be it. But we're going to go through and examine the scriptures and look at some of the Things, some of the characteristics of what this mark is. And more importantly, we're going to find out what the seal of God is because that is what will protect you and I when the mark is placed upon us. So we're going to look at this real quick and examine the scripture on this. Again, this is the mark versus the seal. And let's begin in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4 in verse 16. 1 Peter 4, verse 16. And when we get that, brother, go ahead and read. 1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian... Suffer as a Christian. I want you to not forget that. Do not forget that. If we suffer as a Christian, go ahead. Let him not be ashamed. Uh-huh. But let him glorify God on this behalf. Okay, go ahead. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Okay, so that's when judgment is going to start first. It's going to start with you and I first, brothers and sisters. Judgment will come with us. It begins with us. And if a man suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. See, one of the clues is if you're on the right track is if you suffer as a Christian. Now, I know a lot of people out there, they make distinctions between a Hebrew Israelite or Israelite and a Christian. And I must say... That there is a difference, however, there should not be a difference. They both should be observing and doing the exact same thing. So just for the, the purposes of this lesson, let's assume for a moment that an Israelite and a Christian is one in the same as it should be. So if anyone suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Go ahead, brother. For the times come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Go ahead. And if it first began at us, mm -hmm. what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Yeah, what's going to happen to those who don't obey the gospel of God? Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And we'll pick this up at 15. So we're going to get into the mark. But again, what's more important is that we will discover the seal of God. Okay, Revelation 13 and 15. And when you get there, brother, go ahead and read. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Speaking of the false Christ, go ahead. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Okay, now this is suffering as, suffering as a Christian. So whoever refuses to worship the image of the beast should be killed. Continue. And he causeth all, both small and great, mm -hmm. rich and poor, mm -hmm. free and bond, Everybody, go ahead. to receive the mark on the right hand uh -huh. or in their forehead. Now, I want you to understand something. When we're, we're talking about the right hand and on their foreheads. We have to understand this. Now, the Bible talks about some of this in the past. And one of the things that we have to understand is that when we are referring to the right hand and the forehead, is we're referring to two things because God uses practical things to teach, to give us spiritual understanding. So on the practical side, in the right hand, is what we do. That is our works. That's what we do. So what we do, we act out what we believe. And in our forehead right here is what we think is what we believe. So that's the two things that are characteristics in this, that he will cause them. They're going to go along with it. He's going to cause them. He's going to place a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. What you do and what you think, they're going to be congruent. That will be congruent in everything. And when they do this, when this mark comes upon them, what's going to happen? Verse 17, brother. And no man might buy or sell, uh -huh. save 
he that had the mark, mm -hmm. or the name of the beast, okay. or the number of his name. Or the number of his name. And one of the things we have to understand, whether it is a barcode, which I doubt, but whether it is a barcode, or a microchip, or a large computer, or whatever it may be, or, uh, or anything, you have to understand that they could all be simply a precursor to the real thing. What we have to understand is that one, it's going to be forced upon you. You know what it is when you have to take it or be killed. You'll know then that that is in fact the mark of the beast. But to begin with is what you do and what you believe. It starts there. That's the precursor. Okay? Just like the feast days and the holy days. He manages what we do. So the false Christ and the beast and the false prophet will try to manage what we do and what we think. It starts there. Okay? And that no man might buy or sell, save the mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And we'll get into that. Go ahead, 18. Here is wisdom. Uh -huh. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Uh -huh. For it is the number of man. Yes, it is. Go and ahead. his number is 600, uh -huh. 3, 4, uh -huh. and 6. And people want to know, well, what, what's going on with that? Well, because God, in his word, is trying to give us an identifying mark. How can we find out who this person is? He's given it to you. And we're going to examine that in just a second. Now, before we go there, let's look at John 19. John 19 and 19. We'll read verse 19 and 20. John 19, 19. And when you get there, brother, go ahead and read. And Pilate wrote a tittle uh -huh. and put it on the cross. Okay. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, mm -hmm. the king of the Jews. Okay, so this is when uh, Christ, you know, was crucified. So Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now, I want you to notice something that's a little interesting here. Go to verse 20, brother. This title then read many of the Jews. Okay, go ahead. For the place where Jesus was crucified uh -huh. was nigh to the city. Uh -huh. And it was written in Hebrew uh -huh. and in Greek uh -huh. and in Latin. So it was written in three languages. Now, I think you're going to find something quite interesting. Now, when we look at, when we look at the name of this false, this, this, this antichrist, when we look at this, uh, the name of this person, it says it's 600, three scores, and six. Now, this lesson is not about, you know, uh, necessarily the, uh, the, you know, the mother of harlots and, 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 and the mother church, but we do have to at least mention it. Now, it's common knowledge to some that are, uh, that are versed in the scriptures at any length, really, that the Roman Catholic Church is the mother church. And the Pope, Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ. That is to say, the, uh, the, the, the son of God on earth. Okay? He, he claims to have that power. Okay? Now, when we look at the vicar of Christ, the son, you know, the son, of, Christ, uh, son of God, it says uh, vicarious philidia. Okay? And we take those, uh, those new, the value of those numerals in Latin, and of course it adds up to 666. Now, this is in Latin. Okay? When we take the values. Now, not all... Um, not all the letters have a value, so you have to put zero. But the total is 666, and this is Latin. Now, something else interesting. We, we said Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Let's look at it. In Greek, his name is Latin man or church, Latinos, Latinos in Greek. In Hebrew, is Romith, which is Roman king, Roman kingdom. Okay? So... The value is the same when we take the Roman numerals, when it's alpha, beta, gamma, so on and so forth. These are the values. No matter where the name is, the Lord was sovereign enough and wise enough to give it to us in all three languages so that we can identify them no matter which language it is. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Latin, it doesn't matter. We can identify who it is, and we count the number of his name. Now, one of the things before we move forward, we move to Isaiah 8. When we go to Isaiah 8 and 16, we want to understand something. We, we want to understand that the mark of the beast, that these things that are out there could very well be precursors to the actual mark. We have to understand that most people will accept, accept it gladly. We have to understand that it will be sold to us at first 
as a great idea. It's a matter of national security. It's a matter of what if your child is kidnapped, we can find them. It's a matter of you know terrorism and things like that. Whatever the case may be, it will be sold to people as a very good idea, and most people will accept it. Okay. Now we also read early on where it says that we, that you'll be if you suffer as a Christian. So let let me ask you something. If you are what they call today the Hebrew Israelite or the Israelite or a commandment keeper or the Sabbath keeper or something like that. In other words, a law keeper. And you have other Christians who say that you, you don't have to do that. It's nailed on the cross. You know, none of that even matters. I'm a New Testament Christian and things like that. Who do you think will be handing you over to be delivered? Other Christians. People who call themselves Christians. When the Lord addresses people, whom do he address? Believers. When someone comes up to him and say, Lord, Lord, and he says, I don't know, he's saying to people who claim to be believers. When he says, I don't know you. When they come in, they say, haven't we prophesied this in your name? And have we cast out devils in your name? And he says, I don't know you. But he's talking to talking about people who claim to be believers. When he's talking about, well, Mothers and daughters being against each other and father and sons against each other and and everyone being against each other. It's people who are really followers of Christ and those who simply think they're followers of Christ. But the Bible gives us many identifying marks to know if you follow him or not. And we're going to look at some of these seals here because there are some people who are Christians in word, but they are not Christians in deed. Let's look at this. So now, let's go to the signs and the seal of God. It's more than one thing, and we're going to look at this. This seal, because that is what will keep you. That is what will identify you. Two things, though. When he says you go forth and you be a light, meaning you will stand out in the darkness. There's nothing more, nothing more glaring in Christendom than those who believe in keeping the law, statutes, and commandments of God. And those who simply say, call on his name, and that's all you need. Light. And you will see the difference. Let's look at Isaiah 8 and 16. And we're going to examine the signs and the seals of God. Isaiah, Isaiah 8 and 16. And when you get there, brother, go ahead and read. Bind up the testimony. Uh -huh. Seal the law among my disciples. I'm sorry, say that again for those who might miss that. Do that again. Bind up the testimony. Okay, go ahead. Seal the law among my disciples. There you go. That's the whole Bible. That's everything. Bind up the testimony, which the New Testament testifies of the old, and the old contains the law. Bind it all up, okay? And seal it. Seal the law among my disciples, those who follow him. Plain and simple. Ezekiel 20 and 12. We're going to look at this. Some of these signs. Some of these things. And we're going to let the Bible tell us. What is the sign? What's the seal? What's the sign? We'll let the Bible tell us. Ezekiel 20 and 12. Ezekiel 20 and 12. And when you go get there, brother, go ahead and read. Because we want to be able to identify. How do we know we are of God? How do we know we are on his side? How do we know he recognizes us as one of his servants? Well, let the Bible answer that question. That's a pretty important question. So that you may know whom you serve. Ezekiel 20 and 12. Go ahead, brother. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths. Why? To be a sign uh -huh. to me and them. Wait a minute. So if you observe the Sabbath, the Lord says it's a sign between him and you if you observe his Sabbath. That's what I get. Continue. That they may they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Oh, okay. So the Sabbath is a sign, thus said the Lord. That they may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies and sets them apart. The Sabbath sets someone apart. So there's a difference between law keepers and Sunday keepers, right? Okay, so we have to understand that. Verse 20, brother, drop down to verse 20. And hollow. Hallow my Sabbaths. Okay, make them holy. Hallow my Sabbaths. And they shall be a sign between me and you. Oh, he said it again. Then what? They may be a sign between me and you. Uh-huh. 
that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. And you may know. So we have a sign now. So you know who you serve. You can be assured. You know what? If I do this Sabbath, I'm serving the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At least you get that much right. Okay? So that's a good start right there. Deuteronomy 6, brother. Deuteronomy 6, and we'll pick it up at 6 and 6. Deuteronomy 6. So at least we know we have that much correct and we have that much going for us. Deuteronomy 6 and 6. And let's take a look at this. Okay? We're talking about our hand and our and, and, and our foreheads. Let's, let's, let's look at this in Deuteronomy 6 and 6. And when you get there, brother, let the Bible speak. And these words which I command thee this day uh -huh. shall be in thy heart. Okay, go ahead. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. So we should teach our kids. Go ahead. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. Okay. When thou walkest by thy way. Uh huh. And when thou liest down. Uh huh. And when thou risest up. So all day long. You teach your kids this and you observe this all day long. You do this, okay? This is on his Sabbaths and stuff. I'm talking about his law, statutes, and commandments. And what else shall we do? Verse 8, brother. And thou shalt bind them for a sign uh -huh. upon thy hand. Bind? Now, do you actually have the Ten Commandments, these, these Ten Commandments, these, these, these tablets of stone on your hand? No, but you do them. So thou shalt bind them for a sign upon their hand. And what else? And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Frontlets between thy eyes. So you will do it and you will think it. You will do it and you will meditate on it. You will walk in this way. Walk after the Lord. What you do, he said, is they're going to be on your right hand. And they'll be as frontless between your eyes. What's right? Right here between your eyes, your brain. You will think and meditate on his law. In Psalms it says, the law, I meditate on thy law. Thy law is my delight. So that's what we need to understand. So if you want to sign, it goes back to being in that covenant with him. Okay? That's what it's about. Exodus 13. Exodus 13, and we'll pick it up at verse 9. He said, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Talking about the law. That's what we're talking about. The Lord does something practical, so we in the flesh, we can understand it. And when we get understand it, it snaps to us spiritually. Oh, that's what the Lord means. That's what he means by that. Exodus 13 and 9. And when you get there, brother, let the Bible speak. And it shall be for a sign unto thee uh -huh. upon thy hand uh -huh. and for the memorial between thine eyes. Upon thy hand and between thy eyes. Really? Okay, great. Now, we both know if you read the story that they didn't walk around with copies of the Ten Commandments, each person having their own little copy. Okay, so we know what this means. But we, you know what? We're going to do the whole thing. Tell you what, go to that next part. We're going to look at the whole thing. Go to Exodus 13 and 5. We'll do 5 through 10. That way we can just do the whole thing. Exodus 13 and go drop back to 5 and we'll do 5 through 10. When you get there, brother, let the Bible speak. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites. Okay. And the Hittites. Okay. And the Amorites. And the Amorites. And the Hivites. Okay. And the Jebusites. And the Jebusites. And which they swear unto the fathers to give thee. Uh -huh. And the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh-huh. And they shall keep this service in this month. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread. Now this is when he brings them out. This is Exodus. So this is when he brings them out. He's promising them the land, the, you know, giving them to the... Talking about the promised land. But go ahead. Seven days what? He shall eat unleavened bread. Okay. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Okay. Go ahead. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. Okay. And we just did that actually. Go ahead. And there shall no leaven bread be seen with thee. Okay. He said no leaven bread it shall be seen with thee. So if you, you know, have some bacon soda in your house, okay, fine. But no leaven bread shall be seen with thee. So go ahead. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. Okay, so get all the leaven out of your house. Go ahead. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, mm -hmm. This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. So that's what you're supposed to say to your kids. Okay, back then they were supposed to say, This is what the, uh, you know, the Lord has done because he led us out of Egypt. Today we explain it to you and the congregation and the rest of the brethren. This is why the Lord has done it. Okay, just a little something on a side note. Now, verse 9. Go ahead. 
and it shall be for a sign uh -huh. unto thee upon thy hand. But upon thy hand, go ahead. And for a memorial between thy eyes. And between thy eyes, go ahead. That the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. You should talk about it, go ahead. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. How long should we do this? Verse 10. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season mm -hmm. from year to year. Oh, every year we're supposed to keep that. Okay, no problem. I got it. Exodus 31. Exodus 31. We're going to walk this down and examine it. Exodus 31. But we saw that it shall be a sign. So we see one of the signs. We were just talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was also talking about the Sabbath. He said, that's a sign between you and me. We were just read and just finished reading about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Holy Days, that's a sign between you and me. Does that not identify to you whom you serve? You see someone and you say, hey, you know, what, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, well, you know, I'm observing the Sabbath. You know, I, well, on Saturday, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to observe the Sabbath. I'm going to learn, you know, what thus says the Lord. That's all I'm doing. Okay. He said, oh, well, what are you doing over on the, on the Sabbath? Oh, well, let's see. Oh, that's the, that's the Feast of Pentecost. I'm going to observe that. I'm going to do... People know real quick whom you serve at that time. They know real quick. Whether they agree with it or not, they know exactly who you serve yep. at that time. That's a sign, amen? Amen. That is a sign right there. So let's go Exodus 31 and 13. Exodus 31 and 13. So thus far we see that's the Sabbath, the holy days, is a sign between you and God. Thus says the Lord. So let's look at this. Exodus 31 and 13, brother. When you get there, go ahead and read. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, uh -huh. saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. We shall keep it. Now why is that, Lord? Go ahead. For it is a sign between me and you. Oh, okay. Throughout your generations. Throughout the generations. Okay, so uh, we got to pass it on to our generations. Go ahead. That ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Oh, okay, okay. Now you may say, and we're going to go to Isaiah 59 and 6. But you may say, well, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of like our thoughts and our actions. I mean, sort of, I mean, but I'm not so sure. Well, again, in our ministry, we explain. We explain and we read. So we're going to go to Isaiah 59 and 6, and we'll give you an example Thank God that he gives us examples. Okay, so Isaiah 59 and 6. Isaiah 59, and we'll, we will read 6 and 7. When you get there, brother, go ahead and read. Their webs shall not become garments. Okay, now the Lord's talking about wicked people, but go ahead. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Okay, go ahead. Their works are works of iniquity. Their works are works of sin. Go ahead. And the act of violence is in their hands. Whoa, the act of violence is in their hands. So what we, our hands, what we do, okay? But go ahead. Their feet run to evil. Okay, their feet, so he's talking about actions. Their feet run to evil, go ahead. And they make haste to shed innocent blood. They hurry up to shed innocent blood and go, what else? Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Oh, their thoughts are thoughts of sin. Their thoughts are our thoughts of sin. Go ahead. Wasting and destruction are there in their past. Are in their past. So that's just an example. You know, thoughts and actions. Thoughts and actions. Thoughts and actions. That's what it. That's what it's about. And he said the virus is in our hand. Thoughts of sin. We think of iniquity. Okay. Let's go to Second Timothy because we're still dealing with this seal. Second Timothy and two. Because Paul talked about this a little bit. New Testament, 2 Timothy and 2. 2 Timothy 2, and pick it up at verse 19. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. the foundation of God standeth sure. Go ahead. Having this seal. Having this seal. Now let's see. Go ahead. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Now we just read how the Lord knows us. He said it's a sign between him and us. So we know how he knows us. Go ahead. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ uh -huh. depart from iniquity. Oh, so let everyone that nameth the name of Christ or who call themselves an Israelite or spiritual Israel or Christian, the right Christian, the biblical Christian, let anyone who calls himself uh, by the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Stop sinning. So we know, therefore, sin is a transgression of the law. So we have to stop breaking the law if we call ourselves Christians. Okay, so that's how we know that, you know, that the Lord knows them that are his. 
So that's the first thing we have to identify. Let's see how do we know that we know him. He knows us because he seals us. Sabbath, holy days, he seals that in us. And once you know that, you're not going to give it up. Once you know that, are you going to let someone say, no, don't do those holy days. It's a waste of time. Oh, no, no, don't do that, doctor. It's a waste of time. Now, I understand people will come and tell you that, try to rationalize it away for you. But my question is, now that you are in the truth, are you going to let someone take that away from you? So let's find out how we know we know him. 1 John 2 and 3. One scripture. 1 John 2 and 3. And hereby we do know uh -huh. that we know him. How do we know him, brother? Go ahead. If we keep his commandments. I'm sorry, is that New Testament? Last time I checked, that's New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in 1 John 2 and 3, he said, and hereby we do know. Read it again, brother. And hereby we do know uh -huh. that we know him. Uh -huh. If we keep his commandments. Is that plain? Is that plain? That's, that's pretty plain. That needs no interpretation. I don't need to go to the board, write stuff down. That's how you know. It's that simple. That's how you know. Now, you say you love him. This is how Christ says you love him. Really? Real simple. We're going to keep it simple. John 14, 15. One verse. John 14, 15. And this is how Christ laid it on the table. Plain and simple. And you have many Christians today say they love him and you don't have to do anything and just call on his name and that's it. John 14 and 15. This is what Christ said. Go ahead. 14 and 15. If ye love me, go ahead. Keep my commandments. That's what the Messiah says. You don't have to wiki it. You don't have to Google it. You don't have to do anything else. Just that's what it says. If ye love me, Keep my commandments. I'm sorry if that makes you squirm in your seat, but that's all it is. That's what it is. If you love me, keep my commandments. He also says something else for those who don't, you don't have to do anything. Go to Luke 6. Luke 6. And we're going to read one verse again. Luke 6 and verse 46. Luke 6 and verse 46. And when you get that, brother, let the Bible speak. And why call ye me Lord, uh -huh. Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's what Christ says. He said, why you call me Lord, Lord, do not the things I say? Now, we just read a few things that he didn't say. We just read, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's why it was apropos for me to follow up with this scripture. Why call me Lord, Lord, and I do not the things I say? When the original ruler came to Christ and said, how may I get eternal life? And he said, if thou or stand to, to life, Keep the commandments. So did the Messiah lie to him? No, that's that's how you that's how you get into life. He gave him that. He asked, it's answered. Okay? And this is how you know you know him. You can be assured. This is how you know. That's what's important, brothers and sisters. First John 3. Let's go back to 1 John. 1 John 3, and let us understand something. Now you know, he knows you, he knows that you are his. Because you try to listen to what he tells you to do. Now, you know that you know you are his because you keep his commandments. Now, he says, simple question, why call me Lord, Lord, not do not, do not the things I say? So why call him Lord, Lord, if you don't want to listen to what he has to say? Now, let's go to 1 John, again, 3. 1 John 3, and we'll pick it up at verse 19. Verse 19, verse 1 John 3, verse 19, let the Bible speak. And hereby we know that we are of the truth. Now, this is how we know we are of the truth. Go ahead. And shall assure our hearts before him. We'll be, a, we'll be confident before him. Go ahead, brother. For if our heart condemn us, uh -huh. God is greater than our heart uh -huh. and knoweth all things. So if our heart condemns us, we feel bad. For breaking his commandments. We don't think, oh, it's okay. Oh, it's no big deal. Oh, that's just nail on the cross. No, if your heart condemns, this is how we know we're in the truth. If our hearts condemn us, then God is greater than our heart. That's how you know. You say, you know what? Wow, I really should be putting down that bacon. <laughs> 
Uh, you're not you're not eating it on purpose. And if you eat it on, you know, if you eat it by accident, you didn't know it was in there. That's when grace kicks in, right there. You didn't know. You didn't do it, you know, because it says, you know, if you sin willfully, there remains no more remissions for sin. So you didn't do it on purpose. You made a mistake. You stumble. You fall. You know, in First John it says, you know, we have an advocate in heaven making our petition to the Father. If we sin. But he said, little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate in heaven. Okay. So you make a mistake. So don't let someone trick you into thinking, oh, you, you got to be perfect. No, you're on the path. That's what makes you perfect. Not because you kept it perfectly. You're being made perfect. You won't be completely 100% perfect until you're out of this imperfect body. Then you'll be perfect. That's right. But right now, you are striving to get there. Okay? Strive to enter in. Bible even says, New Testament, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So get on the path. Okay? That's what we're talking about. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Hebrews 8 and 10. Hebrews 8 and 10. He's going to put this in us. Hebrews 8 and and 10. When you get there, brother, let the Bible speak. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. He's talking about back in Jeremiah, but go ahead. After those days, says the Lord. What, what will he do? I will put my laws into their mind. In their mind. Interesting. I'll put my laws into their mind. So they won't be carried around on tablets of stone. He's going to put it in their mind. Go ahead, brother. And write them in their heart. Go ahead. And I will be to them a God. Uh huh. And they shall be to me a people. Is that not what you're looking for, brothers and sisters? You want him to be your God and you to be his people. This is how you get it. Get the law in your mind and get it in your heart. Delight in the law, as the psalmist says. Be happy about that. Don't feel like you're at a loss or you feel like you're being condemned. The law, the law is a curse. Because there's people running around saying the law is a curse. Guess what? The law is the only thing that's going to save you. Hmm. That's the only thing that's going to save you. That and faith. That and faith is the only thing that's going to save you. But you got people telling you that all oh, the laws are cursed. Oh, you put me on the law. That's it. No, 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 no. The law of sin is a curse because it brings forth death. Not, not the Ten Commandments. Not his law, statutes, and commandments because otherwise that means Christ condemned the rich young ruler to death because he told him that's how you enter into life. So we have to use our common sense, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. We have to, okay? Ephesians 1. Let's pick it up because all of this was promised to us. Ephesians 1 and 12. All of this, his law, statutes, commandments, and he said he'll bless you, he'll give us eternal life, we'll have access to the kingdom. That's the promise. That is the promise. But let's look at this a little bit. Ephesians 1 and 12. Ephesians 1 and 12. And when you get that, brother, let the Bible speak. That we should be to the, to the praise of his glory. Uh-huh. Who first trusted in Christ. That's her faith. Go ahead. And whom he also trusted. Uh-huh. After that, he heard of the word of the truth. Okay. The gospel of your salvation. There, see? That, that's what, it's about the word of the truth. It's about the gospel of salvation. Go ahead. In whom also, after that ye believed. There's some faith. Go ahead. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were what? Read that again. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. But look at all the things that's, that, 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 that's sealed in you. Your trust in Christ. The, 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 the word of truth. The gospel of salvation. Your faith. And then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Because you believe all this is going to happen. You believe that the Messiah is going to come back and redeem his people. You believe that he knows whom serves him and that you know you know him by keeping his commandments and coming into this covenant. That's the seal. You, all that is sealed in that and we're not done. All that is sealed. But go ahead, 14, brother. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Go ahead. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Wow. See, now, did not God purchase this? He redeemed this back with his blood. This is what we're talking about, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased promise, which he purchased with his blood. That's what it's about, brothers and sisters. Finish that, brother. 
unto the praise of his glory. Amen. Amen. So let's go to Ephesians 4. Because we're still talking about seals. While everybody's running around and they're trying to figure out what the mark of the beast is. And granted, brothers and sisters, these things that are out there could be the precursor to the real deal. It's just getting everybody ready. That's it. Now you have to cons you have to consider the Satan who deceives the whole world. Could he not throw out a few distractions mm -hmm. so you can back right into the mark? Mm -hmm. So be careful. So it's really important. What's more important than knowing exactly what the mark is is knowing exactly what the seal is, so you can get that and you won't have to worry about the mark. Okay, I'm not saying. Be blind to it, you'll know. But when you guess what? When you get the seal, you'll recognize the mark when it gets here. So let's get sealed by God. Let's get sealed by God. Ephesians 4 and 30. Ephesians 4 and 30. And when you get there, brother, go ahead and read. Let's see what else we're sealed with. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Go ahead. Whereby ye are also you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. That's when he comes back. When the Lord comes, you're sealed unto them. Okay? Now, before he comes back, what happens? The seven seals, the seven trumpets, he show up at the last trump, you're sealed until then. But you've got to get this word and you've got to have the Holy Ghost in you to be sealed. And you will recognize what the mark is. Okay? You will recognize that. He said, greet not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until when? Until, unto the day of redemption. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, brother. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. I told you we moved pretty quick, so you want to write down these scripture references so that you can review the lesson. 2 Corinthians 1 and 21 and 22. 2 Corinthians 1, and when you get there, brother, proceed. Now he... Which establisheth us with you in Christ. Go ahead. Hath anointed us. Uh huh. Is God. So God is the one who anointed us. But go ahead. Who hath also sealed us. Say that again. Who hath also sealed us. He has sealed us. Go ahead. And given the earnest of the spirit in our heart. And give us the earnest of our spirit in our heart. He has sealed us. He's going to hold on to you as long as you hold on to his Holy Spirit and his law, statutes, and commandments. He will hold on to you. You are sealed if you have that. You are sealed. So, who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Let's go to Acts 5, and we'll pick it up at verse 29. So, you got to understand something. When that mark comes up upon you, brothers and sisters, it'll be forced upon you. Now at first it will be accepted it will be suggested and people will take it but then when it comes to the time when it is forced upon you, you take it or die, you take it or go to jail you know for sure that's the mark. You still need to refuse it. Oh well what if they kill me? You need to refuse it. Oh what if they put me in jail? You need to refuse it and go to jail. The Lord said, fear not him that can destroy the body and after which has nothing else, there's nothing more he can do. So it's about, are you going to have more fear of man or are you going to have more fear of God? Once they kill you, there's nothing else they can do. That's it. It's over. So whom will you be more afraid of? Oh, God. Oh, 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 brother, you're talking about something evil and morbid. Why are you talking? Look, if you're not being prepared for what is coming, what are you sitting in church for? Why are you in church if they're not teaching you anything or preparing you anything? Are we too used to just being entertained because the, the, the pastor, he can tell you some wonderful, magnificent stories or he can inspire you and make you want to stand on your chair or run up and down the aisles? Or do you want to spiritually prepare yourself? Do you want to put on the whole armor of God or do you want to just be entertained? Hmm. You don't need to go to church for that. Just put on a couple of CDs and your mood will change. Put on some happy music and you'll be okay. If that's all you want. But when it comes to the word of God, we can have fun. We can love it. We can delight in his word. But we are being prepared. It's time to learn something. Haven't you not been entertained long enough? Now it's time to learn something. And learning the word of God is refreshing. 
And that is entertainment enough. That's a reward in and of itself. Okay, let's go to let's go to Acts 5. Acts 5 and 29. Because we need to focus on God and not worry about what man will do to us. Acts 5 and 29. And when you get there, let the Bible speak, brother. Then Peter and uh -huh. the other apostles answered and said, Uh-huh. We ought to obey God uh -huh. rather than men. Okay, so in this, before this part, uh, before this, if we back up a few verses and we won't, won't, it's they were just at, they were, all the Pharisees was telling Peter and the apostles, quit teaching in Christ's name, quit doing that, okay? Don't mention his name anymore, whatever. And Peter answered and replied, he said, you know what? We ought to obey God rather than men, period. We ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30, brother. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, uh -huh. whom he slew and hung on the tree. Yes, they did. Go ahead, 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand uh -huh. to the prince and a savior, uh -huh. for to give repentance to Israel Go ahead. and forgiveness of sin. This is why the father did all that. Go ahead, 32, brother. And we are his witness of uh -huh. these things. Uh -huh. And so is also the Holy Ghost. And so is the Holy Ghost. Whom God hath given to them uh -huh. that obey him. Now, the Holy Ghost goes to only whom? We're going to read that again. Read, read that, that last part of 32. And so is also the who? And are the witnesses of the things. Uh -huh. And so is also the Holy Ghost. Uh, and now, whom God gives the Holy Ghost to? Read that. Whom God hath given to them uh -huh. that obey him. That obey him. That's who has the Holy Ghost. Flopping your hands around and throwing your head back and rolling your eyes in the back of your head, that doesn't mean you have the Holy Ghost. If you don't obey God, that doesn't mean you have the Holy Ghost. It's those who obey Him. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? The Holy Ghost is not with you flopping around if you're not listening to what He's telling you to do. Okay? So it's time to obey what the Holy Ghost said. And what does it say? It says that He will lead you into all truth. That's what the Holy Ghost does. Okay? He will lead you into all, all truth. Now, let's look at this one more time. Revelation 7. Let's go back towards the end of the book. Revelation 7. Let's examine this real quick. Okay? We're going to see what he's going to do to the 144,000. Same thing. Okay? Revelation 7 and verse 3. And we'll hop around a little bit. Revelation 7, verse 3. And when you get there, brother, go ahead and read. Saying, hurt not the earth, okay. neither the sea, uh -huh. nor the trees, uh -huh. till we have sealed the servants of our God in uh -huh. their foreheads. So he sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So we know what's in their forehead. We know what's on their mind. God's laws, statutes, and commandments, and his judgments that are coming. So they're sealed. Okay? So these are the people who are going to be really... You get tired of hearing about his laws, statutes, and commandments? Well, it's going to be an overtime at this time. Because we know what's sealed in them. Including the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, brother. And I heard the number of them uh -huh. which were sealed. Okay. And they were sealed at 140 and 4,000. Uh -huh. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. You know, there was a mystery. It's like, wow, who were the 144,000? But it pretty much answered it right there. It's 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. No mystery when you're in the truth. But there's a lot of people still running around. They have no idea. Well, who's Israel? Well, who's Israel? And no. It's, it's 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Why? Because to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Okay? And not just Jew, but to Israel first, and then to the Gentile. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Skip down to verse 9, brother. After this I beheld, uh -huh. and lo, a great multitude, okay. which no man could number. No man can number it. Go ahead. And all nations uh -huh. and kindreds uh -huh. of the people uh -huh. and tongues okay, so that whole stood. The, the whole language thing, that's, that's out of there because it's all nations, all kindreds, and people, and tongues. Go ahead. Stood before the throne mm -hmm. and before the Lamb, mm -hmm. clothed with all white robes mm -hmm. and palms in their hands. Okay, verse 14, brother. And I said unto him, mm -hmm. Sir, thou knowest. Uh -huh. And he said to me, mm -hmm. These are they which come out of great tribulation, okay. and have washed their robes, mm -hmm. and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are they who came out of great tribulation. Why were they not raptured up? They came out of great tribulation. Let's just learn something on the way of learning something. So these are they who came through great tribulation. Now let's see, was that a bad thing? 
Read that again. These are they which came out of great tribulation. Continue. And have washed their robes uh -huh. and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Right. Okay. So their sins and everything were forgiven them, you know, because they washed their robes, which white is purity in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, brother. Therefore are they before the throne of God, uh -huh. and serve him day and night in his temple. Go ahead. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Okay, my people, you're, uh, I'm your God, and you'll be my people. Go ahead. Verse 16, brother. They shall hunger no more. No hunger. Neither thirst no, anymore. Th no thirst. Neither shall the sun light on them. No need it. Nor any heat. Don't need it. All right. Let's go verse 17, brother. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne uh -huh. shall feed them. Go ahead. And shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters. Okay. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Sounds like a good deal to me. Sounds like a great deal to me. Say, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Immortality. Okay. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Tell me you don't want some of that. Hmm. Amen. Let's go to Revelation 14, brother. Revelation 14, and we're going to pick it up at verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9. When you get there, brother, go ahead and read. Revelation 14 and 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with uh -huh. a loud voice, uh -huh. If any man worship the beast and his image, uh -huh. and receive his mark in his forehead uh -huh. or in his hand. Uh -huh. Okay, now. Listen to what he just said. He said, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his, in his forehead or in his hand, let's see what's going to happen. Because you get people out there who say, oh, well, God, I understand. Well, let's read his understanding in verse 10. Go ahead. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Okay, go ahead. Which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Uh-huh. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone uh -huh. in the presence of the holy angels uh -huh. and in the presence of the Lamb. Wait a minute. So wait, I thought he would understand. I thought, I thought, oh, well, no, he understand. I, I got to feed myself or I got to feed my family or I, I don't want to go to jail or they threaten me with killing me. So I had to take the mark. Let us review. He said, if any man worshiped the beast and his image and received the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same, talking about the same person, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He's giving you 100% wrath. Bad news. Without, no mercy. Without mixture. No mercy, no kindness. No, no, no. Because you made your decision when you take the mark. You made your decision. That's why I said earlier, oh, well, what if they want to put you in jail? Go to jail. What if they want to kill you? Be killed. Because you made your decision. So don't take the mark. You'll know it because one, you're sealed. And two, big clue, it'll be forced on you. That's what it says. Okay, now verse 11. Now he just said, okay, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 11, brother. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. Go ahead. And they have no rest day or night. Uh huh. Who worship the beast uh -huh. and his image, uh -huh. and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. They will have no rest. But let's see who does have rest. Now, these people who receive the mark have no rest. Now, look at the juxtaposition between those who receive the mark and get all this bad drama on them versus those who don't receive the drama. Verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. So here are the other people. Go ahead. Here are they that keep the commandments of God uh -huh. and the faith of Jesus. So, there's your seal. You want to be the opposite? Then you be those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And you can be the opposite. You don't have to worry about being tortured day and night, forever, forever, in the presence of the angels, in the presence of the Lamb. You don't have to worry about that because you, you want to be these or they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Daniel 7, brother, before we get out of here. Let's look at Daniel 7 and pick it up at verse 25. because we, we need to look at where this stuff is going to come from. Where is all this Mark stuff going to come from? Let's look at Daniel 7 and 25. And we're talking about this little horn. Okay, go ahead. And this, we know it's coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, but go ahead. Or the Roman Empire. Daniel 7, 25. Go ahead. 
And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Yeah, you, the, the, the law is done away with. The Sabbath is the first day instead of the seventh day. Go ahead. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Wear out, persecute. Wear out. Now, we're, we're down in the south. We know what wear out. That means beat down. It's bad, okay? And in this case, he will kill some. Okay? So he will wear out the saints of the Most High. Go ahead. And think to change times and laws. Let's pause for a second. Hmm, what's one law in the Ten Commandments in the Ten Commandments that is both a time and a law at the same time? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is a law, it's one of the Ten Commandments. The fourth one to be precise, and it's also a time, it's the seventh day of the week. It's begun. We're no longer on the Hebrew calendar, we're on the Gregorian calendar. The Lord says that the evening starts a new day. Evening, then morning is a new day. Man says it's at 12.01. Not sure how you know that without a watch. But that's what man says. What the Lord says makes sense. It gets dark. Oh, it's a new day. It's the beginning of a new day. That's dark. You say, well, Robert, well, you know, when the sun comes up in the morning, that's a new day. Well, that's not when you say it's a new day. You say 12.01 is a new day. The Lord says the evening and the morning is a new day. It's day one. Day two, day three, so on and so forth. Okay? So, he wants to, he means to think to change times and laws. Okay? There's a lot of talk about Sunday laws and stuff like that coming out. Go ahead. Which, I forgot what I thought. And think to change times and laws. Okay. And they shall be given into his hand uh -huh. until a time. One year. And time. Two years. And dividing of time. Half a year. Okay, so this is three and a half years, but you're gonna let someone trip you up, trip you up with seven and a half years. Look, at, you have to look at our, uh, our other lessons to get into that. We don't have time to get into that right now. Now, I'm gonna read you just a quick quote, real quick, and we're gonna continue our lesson and finish up. Here's one of the, uh, one of the quotes from the Roman Catholic Church. It says, "Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did, happened in the first century. Where it was really the third century, but the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any direction noted in scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power." Saint Cap Catherine, Catholic Sentinel, May twenty first, nineteen ninety five. I have another. The Catholic Record of London, Ontario, Canada, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. Sunday is our mark of authority. Inter interesting choice of words. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Interesting. The Catholic Record of London, Ontario, Canada, September 1st, 1923. The church is above the Bible. Huh. Okay. That's, that's okay. And many false prophets today are doing it. And what did Christ say? And many false prophets will come and say that I am Christ and will deceive many. Okay. That's nothing new. Nothing new. Ezekiel 22 and 8, brother. We're going to wrap it up. Ezekiel 22 and 8. And when you get that, brother, go ahead and read. Thou hast despised my holy thing. Yes, they did. Go ahead. And hast profaned my Sabbath. And hast profaned my Sabbath. Skip down to 26, brother. Go ahead. Her priests have violated my law. Her priests have violated my law. Go ahead. And have profaned my holy thing. Keep going. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. No, they haven't because it doesn't matter today. And none of that even matters. Just call on his name and it's, it's all good. Everything's great. Just call on his name and that's all you got to do. Go ahead. Neither have they show difference uh -huh. between the unclean and the clean. Don't worry about it. You can eat pork. Just pray over it. No difference between the clean and the unclean. Go ahead. I have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. They have hid their eyes from his Sabbath. And what else? And I am profaned among them. Yeah, they, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the Sabbath thing. Okay. Let's drop down over to... Hosea 8 and 12. Hosea 8 and 12. Go ahead. I have written to him the great things of my law, uh -huh. but they were counted as a strange thing. Yeah, I've written to them the great things in my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. The Lord has written great things in his law. 
All of his laws, his laws, statutes, commandments, not just the ten. He wrote great things because it's for our own good. But now they are counted as strange. We preach and teach the law, statutes, and commandments and the faith in our Messiah. And it's strange to most people. Why would, why would you have to do that? Why would the Lord came and he got rid of the ten. He nailed it to the cross. He paid it for me because he knew we couldn't keep it. And so everyone begins to abdicate their responsibility to keeping the law. Because it's strange to them. It's counted as a strange thing. Let's go on over to Revelation 12 and 17. I'm going to look at this one more time. Revelation 12 and 17. And we get there, brother. Go ahead and read. Revelation 12, 17. Go ahead and read. And the dragon was wroth with the woman uh -huh. and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Go ahead. Which keep the commandments of God. Now, listen. Now, these, this is the people that the dragon is after. Don't, mi don't miss this. The only people, the main people that the dragon is after are these people. Let's start from the beginning again. Verse 17, brother. Go ahead. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Go ahead. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Uh huh. Which keep the commandments of God. Go ahead. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's who he's after. He has the rest already. That's who, whom he is after. That is your seal. That is your sign, brothers and sisters. When the devil is after you, you know you're on the right side. You know you're on the right side. Let's go on over to Revelation 20. And four. We're going to go to Revelation 20 and four. And we have to understand this. This is this is what you want to be. This is where we want to be, brothers and sisters. Revelation 20 and four. And when we get there, go ahead and read. And I saw thrones that they sat upon them. Uh huh. And the judgment was given unto them. Okay. I saw the soul of them that were beheaded uh -huh. for the witness of Jesus. Whoa, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And go ahead. And for the word of God. Okay, so they believed in Christ and, they, and, and, and his word. They believed in Christ and his word. And go ahead. And what else did they do? And which had not worshipped the beast, uh -huh. neither his image, uh -huh. neither had received his mark upon their foreheads okay. or uh -huh. in their hands. So, now, look, look at these people again. They had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had to receive his mark upon their hand, their foreheads, or in their hands. They refused it. They were beheaded. So they were threatened with death, and they accepted death rather than worship the beast. And let's see how they were rewarded. Go ahead, brother. And they lived and reigned with uh -huh. Christ a thousand years. Amen. Amen. That's what you want. Amen. That is what it's about. You have to get into this relationship with God. And he says he knows whom serve him, but will keep his faith, keep his commandments. Why call me Lord, Lord, not do not the things I say? So we have to be obedient. There is a, there is a responsibility for us to be obedient to the word of God and keep the faith. Until next time, this is the founder of Israel. And search the scriptures and prove all things.